Hey guys, I'm going to give you a tour of the typical 21 inch predicted chassis for the holiday sets and the tandem sets and the pedestal sets. The Continental uses the same chassis as the 17 inch tabletop sets. These are the other type of predictors. This is a very different design. For starters, these do not have a power transformer. It is series strung. It's also a hot chassis for the most part. I'll talk about that when we get to it. So, there's no power transformer and the tube filaments are connected in series or right across the AC line. Meaning if there's any problem, any tube burns out, they all go out. The B+, plus, the main positive volt, DC voltage that powers the sets, comes by using a voltage doubler right off of the AC line. So it looks, it looks quite a bit different. The other chassis we've been looking at are long and rectangular. This is um, a bit more square-ish and laid out a bit differently. So let's just very briefly go over what we're looking at here. This is where your signal would come in on the back. This happens to be a UHF model, so it has both VHF and UHF and a local distance switch. So that's where you would hook up your signal source on the back. That feeds into the tuners. This has two. This is a UHF tuner. If your set doesn't have a UHF, this would just be an empty spot here. And here's the VHF tuner. Fairly similar looking to the 17 inch, except that it's on its side and the tubes point out horizontally rather than vertically. These are the two tuner tubes here with their shields. And here's the channel selector and the fine tuning with a pilot light behind them. This is the IF board. Very, very similar to the one used in the other set. So the output of the tuner feeds into this guy. Input on this side, output on this side. Output of that will be uh, video. So this is the IF and the detector. And on this, our main circuit board here, we have the video amp, the sound IF and amplifier, and a sleep circuitry. Uh, vertical and horizontal and sync separator. The high voltage is made inside this box. And the center is where the picture tube connects. And we have our damper tube here. Socket for the yoke. Socket for the electron gun inside the picture tube. That's, that's it. Let's look underneath that. So that's where this very much uh, departs from the 17 inch sets. The 17 inch sets, very similar tuner. Virtually identical IF. Also has a main board, but that constitutes basically everything. These sets have a bunch of stuff underneath. There are actual terminal strips and point-to-point -point wiring under here. A lot of it has to do with the power supply and the fact that this is a series-strung set. So we have some unique things to this uh, the, this type of chassis. This is the 9L37. There's also a very, very similar 9L38 for the tandem. Main difference being it has a socket on the back to connect the long cable that goes to the picture tube head. The layout can be difficult to follow underneath here because the stuff is spread out all over. Your AC comes in here. Now I mentioned it was mostly a hot chassis. Well, that's these plastic insulators scattered around. There's one here, one here. Bunch up on this side. These pieces of metal are floating. They are isolated. These are the parts that connect to the cabinet. And you have mounting screws and posts up front into these insulated pieces. The idea being that the stuff that you may come in contact with, like at the back of the set here, is isolated. This, the main central metal hunk, absolutely goes right to one side of the AC line. Could be hot, could be neutral. It's an unpolarized plug. 
So I mentioned things are scattered all over. So our power comes in here. The power switch is way over here. Push on, push off. Then we have a big old thermistor that's in series with the tube filaments. So this is in the path that snakes all over the place. Real simple basic chuck you can do on these sets is put an ohm meter right on the AC terminals and turn the power switch on and off and see if you get continuity. Often the power switches are bad or the thermistor just they just flat out disintegrate and the disc falls out. This guy could be bad. This is the filament dropper. If you add up all the tube filaments together you don't quite get 117 volts AC. You get less than that. This makes up the difference. It gets very toasty. So we have to have continuity through all the tube filaments, the power switch, the thermistor, and this guy to actually get a resistance reading. If, uh, so that's a good sign that everything is good if you do get a low resistance reading. Some of these other parts. Uh, this is part of the voltage doubler for the B plus supply. The other big electrolytics are in here. And there's one more three section smaller electrolytic right on the other side where I'm pointing. So I think we have four caps in here, one cap in here, and three more in here in terms of electrolytics. We have a number of paper film, ceramic tube, plastic tube, another plastic bumblebee looking, wax coated. They're all paper caps. Replace all of them. There are some ceramic disc capacitors. Some of them are high voltage caps. Leave them alone. They should be fine. That looks like a resistor. Nope, another bumblebee cap. Gotta go. This cap this could be in different positions depending on the production run, but it's only the largest. It's a 0.1 microfarad. That goes right across the AC line. Replace that cap with a appropriate safety cap for across the line operation. That looks a little odd. Power resistor, power resistor. Just the different types of um, body styles to them. But that, 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 and that are paper caps. Replace them all. Resistors, chuck them. Uh, if they're within tolerance, leave them alone. The wire wands are generally fine, but these carbon comps you should double chuck. That's the bottom of the socket for the high voltage rectifier. So that's a basic overview. Now I want to talk in a little more detail about some of the trickier things, I think. Thermistor. That is a device whose resistance varies with temperature. This is in series with the tube filaments. Tube filaments have a property when they're cold, they have a low resistance. This is the opposite. When it's cold, it has a high resistance. And as it warms up, the resistance drops off. Correspondingly, as the tubes warm up, their resistance increases. They kind of balance out. The idea is, if you didn't have this, and all the tube filaments are cold, when you turn it on, there's going to be a big inrush current, several amps. The tubes are all rated for, I believe, 600 milliamps. You keep doing that again and again and again, you're going to shorten the life of the tubes. This will counteract that. This has a high resistance when it's cold. When you turn the set on, this limits the current. Gradually, this warms up. Its resistance drops. It lets more current flow into the tubes. This happens over the course of seconds. Yeah, it takes the set a little bit longer to warm up, but this gives it a nice soft start, prolongs the life of the tubes. These often fail. There are modern replacements. I'll talk about those in a separate video, but briefly, Amatherm makes them 220 ohms cold. Uh, put two of them in series to get close to the 400 ohms that this has. This guy, it's a multi-tapped wire round resistor. Break it down into three discrete power resistors. Uh, we'll talk more about the exact wattage and the values later on. Uh, the problem with these, this one looks pretty good. Usually they look a lot crummier. And in particular, these leads where they come into this cement coated body here, 
they start to corrode and you'll see green spots where the leads come out that often leads to the internal wiring breaking from corrosion so let's, let's go ahead to replace these this capacitor has a cardboard cover because the outside is not grounded this one is grounded this one is not when you're replacing it don't make that mistake there is AC coming in from the line that goes to the negative side of this can. It's part of the voltage doubler for the B plus supply. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a should be replaced with an across the line X type capacitor rated for 275 volts AC, let's say. It's commonly available. Let's look at the control cluster side of the chassis for a moment. So here we have our channel changer, outer fine tuning, pilot light, and this is the outer's contrast, inner volume, push on, push off power. And there are three on the side. This will be your horizontal hold, vertical hold, and brightness. But notice these are hollow. There is a second control down the center of each of these shafts. You will need a small flat bladed screwdriver to get down into there. Even this is too big, you're going to need a small one like the type you use for eyeglasses. What are these guys? Jeweler screwdrivers. And now I can make the adjustment. So, down the center, one of them, I believe the one that's concentric with the horizontal hold is the coarse horizontal frequency. And then one of them is vertical height, and I believe the last is vertical linearity. Easy to overlook these controls. You'll need to adjust these to get the, to kind of fine tune the picture once you've got it restored. Now let's take a look at this odd assembly. It's near the high voltage box and the antenna terminals. It's some folded over black metal with several wires going to it and some ceramic disc capacitors on top. Well, hidden down inside here are the two silicon diodes that form part of the voltage doubler for the B plus power supply. So this is what turns the AC into DC to power the set. These silicon diodes may still be okay. I suggest you replace them. I use 1N5408s. Far exceed the, the uh, specs of the original. Very robust. So why are there all these ceramic disc capacitors on top? It's my understanding that early silicon diodes were more susceptible well, to a number of things. Uh, transient voltages, transient currents. In other words, they were a bit more fragile, maybe considerably more fragile than modern powder, uh, power silicon diodes. So these are there to suppress noise, I believe, when the diodes switch on and off. Um, and you don't want that noise getting into the supply or into the setter causing uh, RF interference and whatnot. So I think that's why those are there. Probably fine. I would leave them alone. You can dig out those diodes or clip them out and mount the new ones down in this assembly or just replace the entire thing with a terminal strip. Leave that up to you. You could probably leave the originals in there. Probably still good, but in case you want to know what this is, it is a silicon diode assembly. Let's swing around onto this side that has a circuit board. This thing should be a fusible resistor. That may or may not be. It's hard to say, but this is what they typically look like. Originally, I think these came with a 6.8 or 5.6. This is a 7.5. They seem to be more commonly available. It's not a critical value at all. This serves two purposes. One, it limits the current to those silicon diodes we just saw on power-up, and it also acts as a fuse. This is only on the B-plus circuit. It is not for the entire set. So this both limits the current when you turn the set on and the capacitors are charging up, 
And if there's a short or an excessive current draw in the B plus circuitry, this will open up and protect your set. As for the circuit board, I do the same on these as I do on the 17 inch sets. And by that I mean I undo all the wires, I undo the stakes, I pull the whole board out, and I shotgun it. That's my technique, that's what I do. I work on a lot of these. Just experience has taught me that there's no sense in taking this board out and replacing a few parts and putting it back in to see if it works because it's a hassle. So while I have it out, I just replace everything. You can get reproductions of these guys. These are the cup plates or K networks. The actual trade name, um, at least by one of the companies that made these, was cup plate C O U P L A T E. There are other names, integrated networks. People call them K-networks simply because on the SAMS photo fact, the designator SAMS chose to use is K1, take K2, K3. If you get the original Philco service info, they are designated N1, N2, N3, N4. So we could just assume call these N-networks, I suppose. All they are, it's a combination of resistors and capacitors in one package to reduce space and um, decrease assembly time. Luckily these days reproductions are available from the TV Restorer guy, but it's not that hard to make them from scratch if you choose to, but I'd say if you, if you can afford to, they're not that expensive, just buy the reproductions and be done with it. And just like before, these guys, these Plastic things with stripes on them. They are paper caps inside. These should be replaced. Some are vertical, most are horizontal. It is possible to leave the board installed, clip these parts out, tack in new parts. In fact, there's one here where I believe they cut one of the leads going underneath the board. Yeah, this this end. The original part is underneath the new part. In other words, this is a new part. This is the old part. They cut one end of it loose, and they J-hooked the new leads on to the stubs of the old leads. You could certainly do that. I prefer to just take the whole thing out and go over it, because there are some other potential issues. Namely, the tube sockets that they used. Here's a close-up of one of the sockets. The problem is there's a thin piece of metal connecting two cylinders from the tubes being taken in and out repeatedly and board flexing these can develop cracks. There are more robust replacement sockets readily available drop-in replacements. They're inexpensive. However, there are a number of these sockets. It's not trivial to get them out. You can stress the board, you can break damage traces while doing so. I'll talk more about exactly how to replace one of these in a separate video, but that is certainly something to check. As far as getting the board out, I will demonstrate in a, in a separate video, but briefly I use an unwrapping tool, combination wrap-unwrap tool. This is the unwrap end, put it over a stake, Twist, 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 and there, it's disconnected. To put it back on, sometimes I'll straighten these out, but these can also develop metal fatigue just like the sockets, and the wire can break and crack. If you heat it up, you can relieve the stress, because it gets work hardened, it's copper. It gets work hardened from being wrapped and unwrapped, and then it gets brittle. But if a little bit of heat treatment, even with just the lighter, and you can make that very flexible again, straighten it out, and you can wrap it back on. Usually I don't bother going through that, I just kind of slide it back down, take some uh, needle nose plier, cinch it up, and then solder it. Um, labeling them, uh, if you're not experienced with vintage TVs or electronics or reading a schematic in general, sure, take lots of reference photos, you can put little sticky labels on all these if you like. I've worked on enough of these and I have the good factory service info and the SAMs and all that and they do 
label these pretty distinctly. Every wire is a different color. I find it easier just to disconnect everything, look at some reference photos or another chassis or the service info and just hook the wires back up the way they were originally. I'll go over individual parts like the flyback in more detail in a separate video, but I wanted to give you a sense of what you are in store for should you accept the challenge of restoring one of these. It looks weird. It is a weird way to assemble a TV, no doubt. But if you look at the schematic, it's a fairly conventional design. Tuner, IF, video amp, audio amp, horizontal, vertical deflection, circuitry, flyback. Just like every TV has. But it, uh, there is a little bit of a learning curve. If you've never worked on one of these before, uh, it's parts aren't where you'd expect them to be. There's just some things kind of hidden and tucked away in places that it's easy to overlook. We'll talk more about that in follow-up videos. That's going to be it for now. I hope you enjoyed this tour of a 21-inch 9L37 Filco chassis from about 1958-59.